The year was 1927. October had been an exceptionally wet month. One and a half times the normal rainfall soaked the ground. Then, on November 3rd and 4th, a tropical storm stalled over Vermont, pouring torrential rain on the already saturated earth. Reports came from the mountains that streams and brooks had overflowed their banks. In the valleys, the lower parts of towns and villages quickly became flooded as rivers rose with astonishing speed. were abandoned on vanishing highways. Communication was cut off as power and phone lines fell. Word of the disaster could not be sent to neighboring towns, let alone out of state. President Calvin Coolidge had no way of knowing what a catastrophe had befallen his native state when the waters came down from the hills. There are numerous rivers and streams to carry off the precipitation Vermont receives. More than 400 ponds, lakes, and reservoirs to store, for a time, any surplus rain that may fall. But this storm was exceptional, overwhelming the watercourses, flowing out of lake beds and over dams. Railroads and highways followed valleys that had once been unobstructed. Bridges and culverts hemmed in small streams critical to drainage. Settlements had grown up along the valley floors. The ancient forests of the state had been cut, and while new growth had sprung up, the land was no longer able to hold the water like a sponge. Conditions, once so well balanced, had changed. So when over nine inches of rain fell on some parts of the state within a 24-hour period, the rivers and the land were unable to handle it. Everybody at St. John Center seemed to be gathering up at the church, uh, around the churchyard, which is on a higher spot. And from there, we could watch the, all the debris and everything coming down the river. And I saw whole farmhouses come down the river that looked just like serene boats, just like galleons, Spanish galleons coming down the river with the geranium pot still in the window. Within a day, Vermont's communication and critical services were cut. 
Vermonters were deprived of mail, telephone, telegraph, electric lights, gas, piped water, highways, and railroads. Dams broke. More than 1,200 bridges were damaged. Houses and barns were swept away by the rushing water, fetching up against bridges where they served as battering rams. Thousands of acres of rich farmland were either washed away or covered with infertile silt. More than 10,000 dairy cows and other farm animals drowned. One farmer expressed his loss in these words, I can buy a new herd of cattle, a new house, and a new barn, but it will take years before I can raise a crop of hay down on those bare rocks on the meadow beside the river. 690 farms were completely destroyed. Many of the fallen bridges were railroad bridges. Trains were stranded and Vermont was cut off from the outside world. of twisted rails and hanging ties. Half of the Rutland Railroad was demolished, its tracks cut in 365 places. Otter Creek poured through Proctor Station and carved a path 60 feet deep where the tracks had been. The Delaware and Hudson, the Maine Central, and the Boston and Maine, all serving Vermont, fell victim. It was the worst disaster in railroad history. Lots of the railroads, bridges were out. So, uh, we ride a little ways on the train and then they'd take us out and uh, put us on either just an ordinary truck, you know, riding the back end, sometimes just standing up. And they'd take you a few miles and then put you back on either on the rails or into a bus. And, uh, and at night, when night come, they, everything would stop so you'd have to stay overnight wherever you were. So it took me three days to come from Long Island up here to Burlington.
the loss to Vermont's industry was nearly as great. At the American Woolen Company in Winooski, water washed through the first floor of the plant. The Fairbanks Scale Company in St. Johnsbury suffered heavy damage to the foundry, machine shop, blacksmith shop, and boiler rooms. The generator room at the St. Johnsbury Gas Company stood under eight and a half feet of water. And at the Twin State Gas and Electric Company, also in St. Johnsbury, the equipment was flooded and buried in mud, the auxiliary plants destroyed. In all, 264 factories and industrial plants were wrecked. This included many of the best print shops in the state. Those newspapers that survived the high water managed to get out at least a tabloid within a day of the disaster by rigging a tractor or auxiliary engine to run the presses. There was no shortage of news, but anything other than local distribution was impossible. Thus, news of relief was slow in coming. It was November. It was cold and wet. Winter was around the corner. Much of the best soil in the state was deposited in dwellings, public buildings, and stores. The ooze filtered into every place where water could penetrate. In basements, it was many feet deep. No furnace heat could be had until the mud was removed. Food supplies were running short. Drinking water was polluted. Hundreds of people were missing and there was no way to communicate. 84 lives had been lost, including the Honorable S. Hollister Jackson, Lieutenant Governor of the state. Yet despite these hardships, Vermonters came together, helping one another through the worst disaster the state had ever faced. My grandparents, since they did have a house that was not theirs, we had to take people in that night whose homes had been completely flooded. And so we had a very full house there, I recall, that night with other residents of the center who weren't so fortunate. Waterbury was one of the hardest hit towns in the state. The Winooski River overflowed its banks. A torrent 18 feet deep rushed down the main street. Even when normal storm patterns resumed, Vermont continued to be cursed with rain. The Weather Bureau in St. Johnsbury recorded 22 inches during November, the total breaking all records kept to that date. The rain slowed down recovery operations and made a miserable situation worse. With 90% of the homes in Waterbury flooded to the ceiling or higher, it seemed that restoring normal living conditions before winter would be an impossible task. Sightseers were a problem, and passes became necessary to get into the stricken areas. The power of the flood could be seen everywhere. Vehicles washed several hundred feet, then buried. Homes in splinters.
cars destroyed. The bridge between Burlington and Winooski had been swept away by the raging water. In its place, a pontoon bridge was erected. Fort Ethan Allen was used as an airplane base from which teams would fly out to survey the damage. cooperation of health officers in the flooded areas prevented sickness and epidemic. The Red Cross provided help and comfort for the many in need. Some houses were nearly submerged, others completely washed away. Bridges left standing were covered in mud. Evidence of the flood still exists. At Bolton, where the Winooski River is narrowest, a dam generated electric power until the storm left it inoperable. All that remains of the powerhouse is a walled slab of concrete. A hole in the floor and water passageways underneath testify that great turbines once operated there. Twisted pieces of steel and bent pipes protrude from the wreckage. The dam itself remains, apparently as strong as ever, but serves no purpose. Its gates are jammed closed, the machinery to operate them swept away in the floodwaters. Is it possible that this tragedy could be repeated? Waterbury Reservoir, built by the Civil Conservation Corps and now operated by the state of Vermont, is one of three flood control dams that hold the Winooski River in check. Completed in 1938, the dam prevented a serious flood in September of that year. Waterbury Reservoir is one of 12 flood control projects serving the state of Vermont. Their primary purpose? To hold the excess water and release it slowly into Vermont's rivers. Vermonters now build factories, homes, and highways with the confidence that the state is unlikely to experience such a disaster again. A disaster which prompted one Vermonter to write, Through the day and the nights, t'was the sight of all sights, and it shook us with heart-swelling thrills. And for years, twill be told how the creeks swelled and rolled when the water came down from the hills.